I am very excited about my guest for this episode. On his website, you'll find that he is described as a comedian, professional roaster, and a human cartoon. He is currently a contestant on season 15 of America's Got Talent. Boy, do we have a lot to talk about. Please say hi to Alex Hooper. Hello, everybody. I hope you just said hi to me, too. I just decided to oh, absolutely. say my own hello, uh, as you instructed everybody else to say hello to me. And uh, hello from uh, this one right here. This is, uh, this is Kim Chi. She's here. Hey, I say hello. She's from Korea. And then number two, <laughs> because these guys don't like me doing podcasts because I don't pay attention to them. That's that's Carlton. He's from Mexico originally. So if I don't at least put them in the, in the podcast, then they get very upset and they bother me the whole time. So well, are, it's great that we have an audience. Yeah, their work is done. Um, they have been they've been quite the lifeline for me over the past few months since I'm home all day. Yes. Um, yeah, we, we have a theory in this household that dogs actually started the coronavirus just to get oh my. Their stay home more. They were like, wow. Dad, you're going on the road too much. You're spending way too much time away from us. So we're going to start a global pandemic to get you to stay home. And congratulations, pups. It worked. For sure. Well, it is a pleasure to meet you. I'm a huge fan, and I cannot wait to have this conversation. But starting out, I want you to tell us a little bit about you, what it is that you do, and how you fell in love with making people laugh. Uh, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a comedian. Uh, I've been doing it, uh, for the better part of 11 years being like, I, as in, I mean, that's the part of where I was actually like, I'm going to be a stand up comedian. I'm going to get on stage every single night. I'm going to tell jokes. I'm going to write, I'm going to, um, but I really, I mean, I've been making people laugh my entire life. It's always been my solace because I was a very angry, uh, child, teenager, very bitter, just very, uh, I didn't uh, vibe with the world. I found it very hard for me to find my place. I didn't understand why I thought the world was against me, but my outlet for that was always just cracking jokes nonstop to hide my pain, um, which many comedians will tell you that that's part of it. You know, we, uh, <laughs> something is wrong with us and then we go, hey, okay, well, how, what makes us feel better? making people laugh and spreading joy. And I just decided that that was the only thing that I would ever be able to do. And luckily there is a way to do it uh, professionally where I can basically make my own rules. And, you know, sometimes I, I jokingly refer to myself as a professional asshole. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not by any means. I'm a very positive, uh, optimistic person. But the side that a lot of people get to see is this thing that is just very um, crude and kind of just I kind of just really walk to the beat of my own drum. And I kind of just don't give a shit about what other people are going to think is funny or th that they might like i just really i i learned a long time ago if i'm not going to be authentically myself then what's the point of all of this and the beauty is that the more yourself you become the more people find you and latch on to you because they people crave authenticity they want to know that you're being real with them and for me the biggest thing that comedy has always done for me and what I wanted to do for other people is it breaks people out of your reality for a few minutes and lets you forget about everything that's going on in your life and the world. Screw your responsibilities for these few minutes. Let's just sit here and laugh about everything. And that to me is just the ultimate escape. It's so interesting that, you know, you mentioned the authenticity thing and, you know, comedy is, it is subjective. It is something that can result in, again, making people laugh, which is what we want. It can also be controversial. It has all sorts of reactions, but I imagine that it, it's, it, it's, it's got to be kind of thrilling, right, to just not know what's going to happen when you go up on that stage and perform in front of all those people. It's the best. I mean, it's literally – it's. It's, I feel, you know, one of the best things you can do for yourself as a human being is scare yourself uh, as often as possible and do things that are breaking yourself out of your comfort zone. And every time I stepped on stage, whether I'm in front of thousands of people or in front of five people, there's this thing that happens in my stomach before I walk on stage and it starts to tighten up and I feel the butterflies. And I have that, that moment where I go, I don't know what's about to happen up there and part of that is terrifying and the other part of hang on, my dog got caught hang on one sec hang on no hang worries on. i i got you come here you <laughs> she went she went behind my desk and got caught in a lamp anyway I think she wants to be uh, a part of the interview <laughs> yeah i guess so 
but yeah, that's, I mean, there's, I, that's the part, honestly, that is so hard for me dealing with not being on stage all the time is that, is that I don't have a way to get out that energy. Like something happened to me when I walked out on stage and I felt that fear, but then I pushed through and I got those laughs and then you get to the point when you're relaxed and you're comfortable. And then you get into this flow state where everything is working and it doesn't matter what happens during the show. You are on top of it. You can handle it. And it's uh, it's really just a beautiful feeling to conquer that every single night, you know, and I miss it, dude. I miss it a lot. Yeah, we all have got to get used to this no new normal for now, but uh, just thinking about all the things that you do between the stand-up and the roasting, I'm curious how all those different things came to be because they're they're sort of different, but they, they all come back to comedy and making people laugh. So what, what's been the process for getting to those things? Yeah, um, I, I've never – the roasting thing, I'll be honest, com never saw that coming. Like that is – such a it's such a weird thing that i'm known for now um but because what happened is roast battle started at the comedy store where i was doing a lot of shows and things like that it's you know one of my favorite clubs in the uh, in the world and when roast battle started i watched it i used to love going because it was this crazy energy and all these people it was like it was like being in a cage fighting match but with comedy and everybody was banging on the walls and screaming and i was this is fun i have no interest in doing that and then a friend of mine um, asked if I would do one with him and he really couldn't find anyone else that would battle him. And I was like, okay, I'll do it this one time. And we had this epic fight. I mean, really just like back and forth slug fest. Like people just kept coming in the room. We went into like triple overtime. People were chanting our names and we walked off stage and we were like, holy shit, what was that? Like that, I, no one's ever started screaming my name in the middle of a comedy show. Like, so this is a level of laughter I've never dealt with before. Like, I, people laugh at my shows. No one ever starts stomping their feet and banging on this wall next to them. And so it was this whole other phenomenon that started happening. And I don't, I don't know what took over in me, but like, I think being bullied my whole life and hating myself my whole life, I was like, I got this. Dude. You gave I, back the power. Yeah. I know how to step up into this and I know how to write these jokes and I know how to burn people harder than they know how to burn me. And I just kept kind of leaning into it more and more and more. And then eventually, like when I started to get really good at it and I became the number one roaster, uh, like at the comedy store in uh, like in, in roast battle, obviously I'm not Jeff Ross status or anything like that. <laughs> but as far as roast battle go, I was number one for it over a year. And so I just started to kind of get bored with what I was doing. And that's when like the pageantry really started. That's when I was like, okay, let me bring my festival life because I love going to music festivals and I love the culture behind it and all the costumes and just, you know, be complete freedom. And I was like, let me bring that world into this world. And slowly I started mixing that with all of my comedy and just really being this person that I truly felt proud of. And that's really when the opportunities started coming in. Like that's when I started getting Comedy Central and America's Got Talent shortly after that. And um, I just realized like, there's no reason to be afraid of what people will think of me anymore. There's, I've heard every joke under the sun about myself and I encourage people to write more and please tell me what you think I look like to you. I love to hear it. Um, but that's, you know, you gotta be interesting. Like you said, like how like comedian and roaster and like, you just have to, if you're one thing, you're going to get fed up with yourself before anyone else even has time for you. So I think the more things you can kind of mix into your life and then swirl those things together and make a nice little Sunday, then everybody gets to eat. Absolutely. That's awesome. Now, comedy, it's a very interesting art because it's its not just the jokes themselves. It's the its the physicality and the timing and how you say things. So who are some of your inspirations when it comes to finding your own unique style? Like you said, making that Sunday. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like Dave Chappelle's always been a personal, my, my favorite. He, I saw him live when I was 14 years old um, for the first time. And it just was like mind blowing how great it was. Um, but people that like anyone who really 
just who has found a way to really own who they are. People like Eric Andre and Rory Scovel uh, and Ron Funches, Ali Wong, um, people that really, when you, when you go up, th- when they go up there, there's no one else that could do what they're doing. And you are just enraptured by their energy and their commitment to what they do. And for me, like, I just, I love everything. Like you could be, you could be a comedian that never moves. They the mic stand is here and you stand there and you just tell your jokes like you know like Ralphie May or Ron White or someone like that. But then I also I love the people that are willing to just like throw themselves all over the place and just make a complete spectacle and buffoonery of what's happening up there. Like there's such comedy is such the beautiful part of it is it's it, like any other art form, it's such a wide range of what you can get. You know, on one side of the spectrum, you have people like Dennis Miller who are just, you know, using the craziest political references and think words you've never heard of or even wanted to hear. And then on this side, you have Felipe Esparza, who basically is just a really intelligent but plays a lovable, dumb idiot. And there's really something for everybody if you just know how to look for it. And that's why, like, there's no, there's, there's like, I never get afraid of, like, oh, don't you think there's enough comedians? Don't you think there's this? It's like, no, as long as you're being yourself, you'll find a way to reach people and the more i lean it if i think an idea is stupid or i'm just like man that's going to be really insane then i force myself to do it because that's the only way i'm really going to learn for sure now one thing i'm wondering about since you go you go all over the place performing do you do you think of every audience as the same it's a crowd of people i'm here to make them laugh or does it differ every time do you do you feel like you vibe off of the different specific kinds of people if you even pay attention in the the different cities and the venues and factors like that? You know, it, it always starts with I have some preconceived notion of whatever I'm walking into, and it's kind of impossible for me to not have that. So if I'm performing in uh, Denver, I'm like, OK, I know I'm going to have a pretty progressive crowd, pretty much left pretty much left leaning you know if i go a little too if if i go a little too dark they i might lose them a little bit and then um but then i love performing in cities like that because it kind of makes me like dance on my toes a little bit more but then right after that the next night i'll be in like nebraska and i'll think these people aren't going to get me at all these are farming folks and they mostly are on the other side of things and then but then i'll go there and realize oh you don't give a shit about what I say. I can go as dark and crude and whatever I want. And you guys are right there for it. So to me, it's just like, as you can always find common ground with any audience that you have, like you could put, if you told me, Hey, Alex, we need you to do an hour. It's in a church right after service on Sunday, I think I would do it. I'd be terrified, but I could definitely find enough material that would be appropriate for it. Not my ideal gig, but I would take it. But um, it really, it, it, that's, it's all about like feeling at them out. You know, you kind of, I, I like to push limits. I like to call them litmus tests. Like I have some jokes in there that I'm like, if I do this joke and it goes well, then that means I can do these jokes because these are the really dark ones. But sometimes I'll do the litmus test and the crowd is like, Oy, oh my gosh, what did we come? What did we pay for? And then I'm like, okay, we're pulling back everybody. I thought you could handle it, but you can't that's okay i got plenty of stuff that's sugar-coated for you you know and that's and that's part of just being well-rounded and just part of really opening yourself up to be able to play anywhere because i think that's very very important well i think that that could be a really interesting transition into uh television we're going to talk about america's got talent in just a second but as i think about you know you talk about you can be in one city and they're di- totally different crowds when you go on tv Yes, there's the audience in the room, or as we'll learn in a second, no audience. But, you know, you're performing. You never know who's watching, where they're watching, could be outside of this country. So how is it to be on a stage where you know that you are talking to people in all different kinds of places throughout the world, knowing, okay, these people, some are going to get my jokes, some are not. What's that like? 
I, to be honest, you really can't think about it that way. Um, you can't think of all you can think about is what's in the room in front of you. And I need to perform for these people in the room because no matter what, you never know who's going to watch it around the world. And you can't assume, I guess, that people are going to what you can't assume what people are going to think about this. Now, I will say when it comes to America's Got Talent, the first time I went on that show, I really like I went in there going, OK, people are going to hate this. Like I 100%, I was like, their audience is going to hate this. This is not what they want. I'm making fun of their heroes. These, these judges are gods to these people. And I'm going in there and really stepping on them. Um, but what I thought in my mind was that, but 1% of people, 1% of people that watch that show will enjoy this. And those people are going to really really like it and if i can get one percent of 10 million people that are watching the show to like it then that's a pretty solid number that's a hundred thousand people that i just got to enjoy this thing so that's enough for me um so i really just think about like what's who's in front of me what channel am i going to be on who's in the room and how can i play this up to my advantage so that i look good no matter what especially like with that first with the first america's got talent clip i thought i bombed like i walked off stage and i was like certifiably disappointed with myself and shaking and just like i really thought i had really made a big mistake by going on the show at all um and then it wasn't until two and a half months later when it hit the internet and the internet started like really like putting me on their shoulders and being like, this is, this is the guy we need. Like, this is who should be on this show. Like, thank God somebody finally said these things. And I realized I was like, Oh, I've become a real life internet troll. Like that's how they see me. I'm, I'm the guy, I don't sit in my basement and I type, I go out, into the biggest audience in the world and I tell them to their faces and that really that really changed things for me like when I did that um when I got so boo angrily booed at I mean I felt eviscerated up there mm -hmm. I, I felt them I could physically see 3,000 people tearing me to pieces and I I just realized after that that like well, I shouldn't be afraid of anything anymore. That is the worst thing most people will ever go through as far as humiliation goes and embarrassment. And I stared right in their faces and I stood tall and I took it and finished. And after that, I was like, that's it. I'm a, I'm a different person now than I was before. I'm not, I'm still going to be afraid, but I know I can handle any of it. Wow. Well, I got to tell you, to be completely honest, I was a part of that, whether it was 1% or probably way more than that, that absolutely loved it. I, I mean, I'm such a huge fan of reality television. I think I remember the night that I was watching that in 2018, and I thought, this this guy is what we need. And this is like, you know, it was kind of, you know, the, yeah, you got the buzzes, but I was like, you know what? That was just great television. And so however many weeks ago when you were on again this season— they have the, you know, they do the shots of the holding room and they're showing who's there. And I'm like, is that Alex Hooper? And I'm like, no, probably not. And then you were the first guy up. And I was like, I was yeah. spot on. That is Alex Hooper. And I was so excited. More uh, great television. And uh, for those that have not seen in 2018 or this year, 2020, talk about that second time going back. And then we're going to play a little clip from that uh, second performance. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I got to say, when you were like, I got to say, I was part of that. I thought you were going to be like 99%. Oh, my God. In <laughs> front of you, Alex. We hate you. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, okay, what am I stepping Setting you up just to be really <laughs> <laughs> I, In this day and age, dude, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. Like, just have a podcast of all your enemies on and just bring them on and just tell them how you feel. Who is the <laughs> real internet troll now? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a 2020 move. Oh, my God. Um, so the second time was, I, I realized, like, I, I really thought the first time was one and done. I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to go back. There's no way they would ever let me back on the show. But um, I came up with this idea of like, well, what, what if I apologized? But through my apologies, I did it all over again. And the producers of the show were super into the idea and they really liked it and when I, I knew I was going back I kept telling myself I was like whatever happens you know you're going to be okay but this time 
this time you're going to get them. Like you're going to turn the judges. You're going to turn the audience, no matter what, you know, you can do this again. And the fact that you're going back, it just shows courage and it just shows strength and that you're not going to get beaten down by, you know, people on the internet or people in the audience. And I'm going to show resilience and I'm going to come back. And all for like weeks in my head i'm running these jokes again and again i'm watching the reactions like i'm sitting and i'm meditating and i'm literally going through my entire performances i'm half standing on the stage i'm looking at it through my own eyes i'm looking at the judges i'm looking at the crowd and i'm figuring i'm visualizing it time and time again of like this time will be different i'm going to make them understand and when I found out there wasn't going to be an audience there. And I mean, even more than no audience, I mean, this day was stressful because when we, when I got there that day, um, as soon as I got there, they sent 75% of the crew home because I shot on March 14th, March 15th is when quarantine started. I shot Mm. on the 14th. So already there's things in the air. I had already had shows canceled that week. And when I got there, they um, sent, everybody home except a skeleton crew that was going to shoot the actual auditions. So normally when you're backstage at that show, there's hundreds of people running around, like trying to get, Hey, Alex, we need you for a second over here to take pictures. Hey, we need you over here for this. There's dance troops that are doing these entire routines. There's little girls screaming, singing at the top of their lungs. There's mothers that are beating their sons for not doing their card trick. Right. Like there's, Every excitement in the world is happening backstage. And when they sent everybody home, nothing. It wow. was just silent back there. So wow. all of us, like the contestants are just kind of like sitting around, like going like, this is weird, right? Like this is so bizarre. And they even told us, they're like, we're done with auditions after today. We're canceling all of next week. We're going to get to as many as you can today. But if we don't get to you, that might be it for me. And it was like, so now all of us are on really on edge. We're like, oh, this is the last day and we might not even get to film this thing that personally I had been waiting for since September and we shot in March. So everyone was very, was really shook up and really nervous and you could feel it in the room. Um, but, you know, but like any performance, you got to shake everything from the outside world off and just come back to center and just know that like I have a job to do and I have these couple of minutes to do it and I need to ace it right now and it doesn't matter what else is going on but it was I mean it was it was definitely exciting it was definitely really scary to walk back out there again and know that as soon as I walk back they were going to know who I was and have an opinion one way or the other about whether or not I should be back and luckily for me my visualization came true except for having an audience that was definitely did not come true but uh the rest of it did so you know got a standing ovation from the three of them that was nice wow well i gotta say we're gonna get to that clip but not only between between your performance between all the other comedians i don't know how many you got to see but i've really loved this season of agt probably more than i have in like this has been one of my favorite years of agt and having that those episodes without the audience was really it was really eye opening it was it was good to have something different especially that you're in that same venue all these years you know you get a different atmosphere but it's just so interesting how like you guys really rose to the occasion without that audience i'm going to play the clip right now here is alex hooper performing in front of howie mandel sophia vergara and the simon cowell and finally from beauty to beast <laughs> Hi, Dad. (laughs) Simon, how are you a vegan and that's the least annoying thing about you? (laughs) I will say I am so excited for your new movie. What's it called? Fifty Shades of Tan? (laughs) In closing, yes, I am sorry. I'm sorry that none of the judges were born in this country. So while America's got talent, it does not have a strong immigration policy. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's great. What do you think it was that just, it resonated this time and and we're all thinking, what's this guy going to do? He's apologizing. Is he going to go back to what he did before? It clicked this time. So talk about that. I had, I had a really good moment when I walked out on stage because obviously, like I said, I knew I was going to walk on stage and they would immediately know who I was and cast some sort of judgment on me. But the first thing that happened was I went to apologize and Simon said, 
no need for that. You, I thought you were amazing last time. I thought you should have gone through. I think everyone here made a mistake by not putting you through. And I'm really excited to see you again. So immediately I was like, oh, okay, that's good. And Howie said this, it resonated the same thing. He said, I got caught, because Howie buzzed me really quickly last time. And he said, I got caught up in the audience and how much they didn't like you. But then I went back and watched it and realized it was hysterical. So I went up there and I was like, okay, cool. I actually, I'm, I feel relaxed right now i feel like they're really going to give me an opportunity and a chance to prove myself again and when i started luckily there's about there, you can there's only four three judges that day because heidi was six so i'm looking at three people but there's about 25 people in the theater like between producers backstage people people like that and they were all cracking up so even though i couldn't see any of them i could hear this huge amount of laughter coming from a very small group of people and i kind of knew that it, i knew it was going really well and i and i realized i was accomplishing my goal in the middle of it which made me get even more relaxed and even start to like play it up a little bit more and the more relaxed i get the more fun i am like i know i can always tell when i'm having a lot of fun on stage because i start kind of just like tweaking my body in all these weird ways and like mugging the camera more and i'll like kind of just like lean like around like my body becomes kind of like a gelatin and I just let it do whatever it wants. And if you ever see me like that on stage, that means I am 100% in my element. If I'm ever like stiff and just like behind a mic and like two handing it or something like that, that means I'm not comfortable yet. But I felt, I felt it on that stage that night. And when it, as soon as I was done and they really said they stood up and were clapping and they started complimenting me um, and telling me they wanted me to come back and do it again. And I mean, it really um, it is just the redemption felt so good, man. It really like it, I, I literally realized I was like, I have stared fear in the face a second time and I have walked up this goddamn mountain with no ropes and I'm standing at the top and I feel stupendous about what I did. Wow. So I'm also, this is just a tiny little thing, me sort of nerding out with reality television. Uh, we didn't play this part in the clip, but it was kind of funny how you, you roasted Howie and then you were just like, Sophia Vergara. And you're just like, I love you. And then you went to Simon. What was the thinking behind that? They cut it. Oh, did they? They cut it, dude. Oh, they, man. they, the thing, the thing here is, this happened in my first round two, is the first time I went on two. There's a couple jokes that I, loved and they don't and you have no i have no control right. over the final edit i have zero control i i relinquish everything to them and i trust that they do a good job i will say they do an amazing job they cut some of my favorite jokes oh, from this audition and i'm and i don't i have to ask i have to talk to them about why they were cut and stuff like that so i can know how to play future rounds mm -hmm. basically but um I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, like, Sophia Vergara, I said, um, I say Sophia's from Columbia. If you ever heard her speak, you know, I don't mean the university. <laughs> um, and then I said, you sound like a chihuahua in a blender set to high. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and then I and I my last joke for her was um, was Sophia. I can't think of one reason why you're famous, but I can think of two. And I was really proud of those jokes and really happy with them. And when I, when I watched the cut, when I watched it on TV, I was kind of like, oh, man, I cut all those. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, it's fine. That's how it goes. And I, uh, it's, you know, I it just means I can maybe use those jokes somewhere else. But um, it definitely it's weird. And people have asked me about that because there is this there's this odd cut. That, yeah. Like, if you're if you're savvy, if you're not savvy with reality television at all, you're not going to notice it. But like I noticed it, of course. And if you noticed it, I know other people did, too, because there is this moment of just like, I love you. huh? I thought that was and, what it was. I didn't even think about the fact that they probably cut something out. No, yeah, they, uh, I, I'm not, I, I will, I don't care how much I love you. I will hit oh, everybody. Oh, for sure. And Sophia Vergara, Sophia is a 
queen to me. I mean, I, that is such a perfect woman. I was so excited to get to like tell these jokes about her. And then, I mean, even afterwards she tweeted about me and I was literally just, I mean, my, my, my heart just like literally like just dropped all the way down to my feet. It was just like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I'm just like sitting on my couch at home, like going like, what is happening right now? What is life? And, um, I just hope that for the next, whatever I do next, I hope they uh, keep some of hers in there. What a what so. a good pick for a judge. And who knew? Because like they're, Howie's like the comedian. Simon's the music man. Heidi's in fashion. Sophia, you know, she claims that she's like not an expert or anything, but she, she's good. She's a great judge. She's, she's, well, she's just so like, yeah, right. You know and what funny, I mean? It's yeah. like, it doesn't, it, you, you want her approval for whatever reason, even though like, I mean, she's a mogul, obviously. Yeah. I mean, she is, you know, she is she's capped. She is 100% one Hollywood, but even though you're like, Oh, it's just a woman from modern family or whatever you see her. And you're like, I, whatever it is, I want you to like me. Right. Just please give me any sort of attention right <laughs> now. And, that's like the end of my audition. She says, she's just like, I love you. I love your outfit. I love your tail. <laughs> your I just tail. want you to come back and destroy me. Oh and, my I gosh. Just like, uh, and I was just like, and I was just like, uh, 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 like just like salivating, but like just from smile. Like I was like, oh good. I would love to do that. But it's inside. Like I'm like, I cannot get an erection right now. This unitard is form fitting, skin tight. <laughs> Everybody will see it. Please control yourself. Oh my Alice. God. Did, so did you, um, did you have any jokes planned for Heidi or did you know that she wasn't going to be there when you were filming? So I knew she wasn't going to be there. Um, I had prepared jokes for Eric Stone Street, who was there a couple episodes before. Mm. And they were like, Eric Stone Street's probably going to be there instead. But then I found out the day of that Heidi or nor Eric would be there. And I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? And they said, just you got jokes, roast or share, dude. Like, that. I was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, good. Cause I don't want these jokes to go by the wayside. So I actually had a three. I had, I always have at least three for, ev- for everybody. Normally it's more like four. So if you only see one or two or one and a half, just know there's a couple that you didn't get to see. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, I had a really, I had a really like silly joke for Heidi where I was like, maybe Heidi is here and she's a ghost. <laughs> Last time I was here, I heard nothing but boo. Oh, that's great. You know, like, <laughs> You know, just like a silly, yeah. little, just like it's a, it's like a children's joke at that point. One of the one of the funny things about being on this show is like people will send me messages there and they're like, "You're not Don Rickles, you know? That was a guy who knew how to roast." And I'm like, "Hi, I'm on a family television show. Right. What the fuck do you think I'm allowed to say here?" Like. Uh, I, if you want to watch, if you want to watch me go hard, then watch my comedy. I've seen like, <laughs> very yeah, different. Th- those, uh, yeah, I am go. I am no holds barred. I am saying the sickest possible things I can think of. Whereas where I'm on this show, it's really a challenge to write these jokes because it needs to be cutting enough that the judge will feel something, but also light enough that a seven-year-old watching is going to be like, mommy, what did that mean? Right. You know? And so people, you know, I I have to write jokes that are going to be appropriate. And that's, it's a challenge, man, because my brain always goes to the worst thing immediately. I try to go as hard as I can. And then a lot of times, like I'll send jokes to the producers because they do have to, they, they do have to hear what I'm going to say beforehand. They don't just let me walk out there and be like, all right, let's see what Alex does today. Um, so I have to send them and a lot of times. They'll be like, okay, we're going to need you to pull back uh, a little bit on some and a lot on others, because this is, too much and i'm like okay cool then i'll send them a bunch more and they're like okay that's more what we're looking for and we can work with that you know maybe you can actually go a little more on this one but this one is we can't say that and so it's just a lot of trial and error and back and forth with all of them to try to really get to a place where we're both happy and that's one thing i will say about the show they listen to me a lot um and they really let me have a lot of creative input and they really they've told me many times they're like we don't want to take away from what you do you we're not roasters this is what you do so please tell us what will help you and they're very good at facilitating things like that um for their performers for sure i think my favorite probably my favorite roast was back in 2018 when you said to simon about his teeth those things are so straight and white they look like members of trump's cabinet that was classic 
Oh man, yeah, thank you. That was a uh, that was a really that was that was and that line did very very well. Uh, resonated with a lot of people, and I'm glad they let me do it because honestly, it's one of those things where it's like the. I know they probably thought about that before they right. put it out there because they have so many, like a lot of the Trump's people watch a show like America's Got Talent. But I think in the end, they also realize like, well, what's he really saying? Right. He, like, is it, you know, it's, is it, is it really a diss? Like, no, he's just stating a fact right. that Trump's cabinet is very, very white, and so I'm glad they, I'm glad they kept that. It's always bizarre. It's always weird to me, like what they keep and what they cut. Yeah, because sometimes I'm like, I'm just like that. That's what you cut. Um, you know, the reason when I said Sofia Vergara this time, I went like, I did it really slow. I went like, hello, yes. so be because the next line was, sorry, I always slow down around curves <laughs> and. You know, again, just a cheesy little, yeah. just like a little play on words. And so when they when they cut that part too, I was like, well, that just looks really odd now. Um, but it only, I think, you know, it's always going to look odd to me. Nobody else is really out there going like, huh, hey, something just happened there. Right. Yeah, <laughs> this guy is soft. Like, that's not what anyone else is thinking. And you have to really get that out of your brain as a comedian anyway, what anyone else thinks of you. Yeah confidence is it takes forever to get there and it took me a long time to get there but confidence is everything and knowing who you are and just standing by what you do no matter what yeah and i, I do think it, i really wish heidi was there that second time because just the way heidi is with comedians and probably really not liking what you said to her the last time it would have been great to see what and I'd, i imagine her reaction when she finds out or when she uh found out that the other three put you through she's probably like what but you know we'll see oh yeah and i i love that simon called it out he's like heidi's gonna be so pissed yes. when she comes back but that was i will say i was so glad um when they were showing this this current season when they were showing my backstory yes. and they 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 played my favorite joke which was the heidi klum joke where i said you are magical for children yet your body looks as though you haven't paid attention to any of them right and when i wrote that joke i immediately like that was like a pen dropper for me i was like oh my god that is perfect like i'm complimenting her it's bringing in her family but it's not about her family it's it's everything about that joke i love and the fact and that's the joke that people were the angriest at me about like i got so many messages about that from mothers who were like how dare you bring like, so much mothering into this do you have any idea what it's like to be a mother you are a monster and all this stuff and i was like i i, I was just like okay you don't get the joke you just don't understand where I'm going. And the fact that AGT played it again, that joke, I was like, oh, like, thank you guys. Like, cause that was, I was so happy with that one. And I love, I, you know, I like, I like that people are talking about shit like that. Like, it's fun. Something that's really fun that people don't seem to understand for me is that like, I get all these negative comments and people think they're hurting me in some way. And they're not like, I own who I was years ago and you can't tell me anything about myself that I don't already know or feel. So when people tell me these things, I really just, uh, I'm just like, you're talking about me. Like you're taking time out of your life to go on the internet and share a clip because you hated it so much. And now you're sharing me with other people in your life because you don't like me. Like I'm winning right Have now. Have you seen like, this is those reaction videos? I, 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 on YouTube, there's reaction Alex Hooper audition. I think it was more from the 2018 one, but there's people that make reaction videos to your audition. Uh, I've seen that they're there. Yeah. I don't, I, I've never watched, I've never watched them. Um, Cause I mean, at this point, dude, I mean, I've seen that first clip. I mean, I, I lived it, but I've probably, I've probably watched it myself a hundred right. times just because like, what, like it's, there's something, I feel this sense of pride when I watch it because the same feelings come back of being on stage and being absolutely terrified and feeling all of that, like, danger kind of just coursing through my veins and then just being able but remembering how it felt to just like stand up there and just take the hits and keep going and it's yeah i mean the fact that people talk about it and they share it and things like that and they comment on how much they even how much they don't like me every time somebody does it i'm like 
you don't realize that you're just beating the beast more. Yeah. Well, one more note on AGT. One thing that was also interesting was this time around, uh, Terry Crews was the host. And uh, what Terry said to you, I can't remember if it was before or after you went on stage, but saying that you were a beacon of light in this world. I think just on a serious note, it's interesting, like, you know, comedians, especially when you go out there and you roast people, they have all these sort of negative um, perceptions of people who who are roasters or who are comedians. But, you know, the truth is that there's a lot of kindness coming from that community because, you know, you talk about how, like, you know, sometimes your material comes from a place of pain or you you, you really just want to spread joy, whether it is the dark stuff or the, the funny stuff that you're happy to talk about. Like, the fact that Terry brought that up I thought was really great because we had the laugh, but he also brought up the point that, you know what, comedians are – mostly good people who genuinely care about others, you know? Yeah, very much so. I think what a lot of people didn't realize about my first audition is they thought it was all one big trick. They thought when I was saying, like, I just love everyone, I want to give everyone a hug, I just, I'm a positive person, like Carrie said, I'm a beacon of light. That is 100% who I am. There's no fabrication or embellishment there. Like that's me. Like you ask any of anybody around me, like they know me as this very jovial, positive person. And the reason why I like the roasting thing so much is because it's completely paradoxical to what, how I live the rest of my life is I, the rest of my life, I'm just, I'm trying to lift people up and I'm encouraging everybody to be the best that they can and to go out there and live their life. And then I go out on a show like that. And if you don't know who I am, I'm just this freakazoid monster that is going on stage for no other reason than to be a dick. And to me, that's part of the fun of it is that I get to live this alternate persona whenever I feel like it where it kind of separates me, my roasting, like it becomes more of myself as a character than myself as a human. And I'm perfectly happy sometimes to drop myself and play more of an Alex Hooper character that people have come to expect from me. Um, Cause I know I can always go back to being the happy idiot that I am <laughs> in real life. And it's kind of, it's, if I, I think if I was just a dick, the act wouldn't work. And the reason why I wear those outlandish uh, outfits is because I think it separates me completely from just being a, like, if I just went on stage, some 35 year old white guy with a mustache and was like, let me tell you all why you suck. <laughs> People would be like, what the fuck? Like, get this, cancel this guy immediately. White people are done. This is over. Like, but because I go out there with this colorful outfits and a little tail and I'm just prancing around, like I'm basically a jester in a court. Like I looking, I'm looking at the king and I'm the only person here who's allowed to make fun of you without consequence. And the peasants and in the crowd. <laughs> I take that role the peasants in the crowd. Yeah. I take that role very seriously. And I'll be honest, I never, the peasants thing, dude, that was out of nowhere. That was never in my script or anything. But that first audition, they were being so loud. I couldn't even hear <laughs> myself talk. And literally, I just, I was seconds away, Bennett. I was seconds away from just going, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> Every one of you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck. Like, I was ready to just everything burn this place to the ground say i don't care about tv anymore and in my in my brain thankfully it was so on fire that it was it was like don't say that say something very similar that will make it work and then the calm down peasants line just came out and i think that's when really that's when the lord farquad references really started um because that's everywhere online is like is like what's this lord farquad doing roasting the judge <laughs> and I think it's just because I said the peasants thing and um, and that just became a go to for me from that point on was just like, you know, anytime it's it's only AGT. Like, I don't refer to my regular fans as peasants or anything like that. But if you're an AGT fan, you're a peasant. Well, and yeah. I'm proud. I, I, and like, be a proud peasant. I actually sell my I sell shirts now on my website that say calm down peasant. And they have. The oh, well, I'll have to get that. Well, the fact too, that it came so full circle, because when you couldn't do it, you couldn't perform with an audience, you said the peasants weren't here. You know, that yeah. was great. Oh, yeah. 
that was one thing where I was like, it's you have these like moments where you go, oh, I have the I have the perfect thing to say. And it doesn't happen all the time. And especially right now, I think it happens a lot less because I'm not on stage nearly as much as I used to be or at all. Um, but in that moment, I was so fired up and my and so ready to go and I'd been conditioning myself to be ready for this moment that I was like no matter what happens I will have the right thing to say and as soon as Simon said we need an audience and I was like and I said that a little bit easier without the peasants maybe chirping back there it was like I'm so glad they kept that in again I really am yeah now uh with AGT I not only was AGT affected but unfortunately this pandemic this crazy time we're living in it does it's affecting all of us it's affecting entertainers so being in comedy, you know, trying to just stay positive and look to the future when you can get back on stage again. What's life like right now as a comedian? It's hard. I mean, it's really, it's really difficult. I, the, the big thing for me is that like comedy is such an outlet for me to get out my thoughts and my personality and this energy that I have constantly brewing and marinating inside of me. And it used to be that, okay, all day I think about what am I going to do on stage tonight? What jokes am I going to tell? Do I have any new material that I'm excited about? What am I going to do when I go up there in front of these people? Where do I need to be? What time, you know, what am I going to wear? All this other stuff. And now I can't, I don't think about any of that stuff because the only shows I'm really doing are online shows through Zoom, which are super fun, but the stakes aren't there. I'm not walking in front of a crowd of people that are like sitting there going, well, what do you have yeah. to say? <laughs> and I'm just, and then I have to prove myself. So it's really, it's really difficult to know what to do right now because before, like if, if like, my AGT was on this past week, I would have been emailing every single club owner and manager and every single person going, Hey, here's the new clip. Check it out. These are my dates that I have available. I'm coming through um, Wisconsin then, and then Minnesota and then Chicago and then New York. So here's my dates. And I knew exactly how to play it in this new reality. I don't really know what to do as much. Uh, I'm kind of just really just, I'm, trying to create opportunities um, for myself through just making like either blog posts or YouTube videos or um, anything to just keep getting myself out there so that people keep seeing who I am and what I do without me needing to get on stage. And for me personally, it's been an, it's been a really hard time just because I'm such an outdoor person and I'm such like, I always go to festivals and concerts and comedy shows like six nights a week. I'm out of the house doing stuff and to not have that right now has been really kind of a mind fuck of just like, okay, so what do I do with myself when everything is taken away from me that I'm used to? And it's been just a lot of the, you know, a lot of learning, a lot of meditation, a lot of reading, a lot of exercise. Um, I slackline a lot, uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, you know, it's like walking on a tightrope. It really like levels me out and calms me down. And um, and just trying to figure out how to navigate the new landscape. And it's scary. It's really difficult because my whole thing has always been get on stage and do it in real life. I don't want to watch YouTube videos. I want to experience the performance. I want to be at the concert. I want to be at the comedy show. Wherever it is, I want it live. And that was always my thing. So I was always like, that's what I want to give to people, the live experience. I don't want you to have to watch a clip of me or read a, or read a post that I wrote. I want you to feel it with me. I want you to be there. And that is really tough. Um, I miss just having constantly meeting people everywhere I went. Because the cool thing about being a comedian is like you show up to a brand new place that you've never been, but you're not a stranger because there's people, there's other comedians at the club that this is their hometown. There's fans that were like, hey, do you want to go to the best milkshake spot in the city? We'll take you there after the show. And it's like, oh, cool. All of those things. And now part of me is afraid that a lot of that's not going to come back. Like the people aren't going to, I'm not going to be able to hug fans after shows. I'm not going to be able to get in a car with you and drive to the middle of the woods because there's a secret rave happening in the middle of the, in the middle of the forest. And you're going to take me there. Cause you know, that's my shit. I'm afraid that that's not going to be a possibility anymore. And I, 
I, I hope that it is. And I do think things will return to some sort of normalcy, but you know, there's no, there's no like on the other side of this or anything like that. We've really been sucked into a black hole and we're all figuring out, you know, our new way of life. And we just have to do it together and try to support each other as people go through stuff. Cause I don't know about you, but I mean, I've had, I've, I've been managed to feel pretty good during quarantine and keep my levels good and practice a lot of self care. Sorry, self care. <laughs> I was like, self care. Self care. <laughs> um, but I've also, I've lost friends. I've mm. had three friends uh, die during this oh, thing man. and none of them from it, but all of it kind of as weird, indirect yeah. results of it. And it's so weird to have to lose friends during a time when everyone's going through something together because you really have to like you process it you give them their time you think about them and what they meant to you and how they inspired you and how you love them but then you really have to move on rather quickly because there's too many other things flying at your face you don't really have time to sit with anything because the next thing you know you know there's crazy police brutality happening six blocks from my house so how am I not going to pay attention to that and this is um it's it's a weird i mean the world's always weird right life the whole our whole existence always but this year is just enough like nothing we've ever seen exactly and you know my fiance said it really well she said this is a lesson in uncertainty is that nobody ever really knows what's going to happen and the first time she said that i was like god damn it you're right but also fuck you <laughs> like because i this is like one of the first years i ever went in going okay here's what i'm gonna do i know i'm gonna be on agt again right before i'm on agt again i'm gonna record and release a second album so that people find it and then a couple months after that i'm gonna shoot a special and i'm gonna have this special ready to go so that as i grow this fan base I'm, i kept saying i'm not gonna i'm not gonna walk through a door i'm gonna break through a wall people are gonna say whoa where the hell did that guy come from and all of a sudden he's here and all of those plans and like uh, so many of those things just fell out like i can't do them anymore i had i was supposed to record an album in pittsburgh on april 11th obviously that didn't happen and so i was so ready with all these plans and i've had to shift everything and basically like i mean i write in a journal um you know, a few times a week, um, just to get my thoughts out. And almost every journal entry of the past three months is like shift, adapt, change, be willing, be open. Like there's those were those same words keep coming in again and again and again, because I have to keep reminding myself that you can't think about how it was anymore. Mm. We only can look forward and think about how it's going to be and how we can fit ourselves into this new mold and make it work for not just ourselves, but also the people around us and the world. I, I, my purpose hasn't changed. Like my purpose has always been spread joy, give love, have fun. Like, that's my thing. Like I always like, like, that's what I want other people to feel. And that hasn't changed the way I put it out there. has to. Right. Well, I also think, you know, you mentioned it's uncertainty, but like, even for me thinking about like what we've taken for granted, I mean, like this year for me personally, like January was great. February first, I got the flu and that sucked being at school and having to figure all that out. Uh, and then I went through this really pretty dark time, but this is before quarantine. This is before any of that. And I was just starting to come out of that. It was like late February. I mean, the, one of the last big things I did, but like I was at a convention with so many people, which now would literally be impossible. I was just coming out of that dark time. I was just starting to appreciate what I had. I'm a freshman in college. I'm finally starting to like my school and feel like I belong there. It's a community for me. And then to get taken away from that and to have to come home and now I'm not going back on to campus in the fall. Who knows when I'll be back there. It's just like it, it's so hard but also so important as a lesson to like how, you know, we do take things for granted. And al although it's okay to have these feelings like whenever, like you said, there's not really a, another side. It's more of just like the new normal. Whenever we get to that, I think we really have to start like appreciating life more. And even when we go through tough times, just know we've got to, we've got to live life to the fullest, I think. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I'm, I, I do feel fortunate that like, I am already at the place in my life where I'm, I like, I'm comfortable in my 
um, my home life and my finances and my professional life that I've been able to just kind of like allow myself to take a break and really relax yeah. and appreciate the forced slowdown of all of this. Um, just because I had worked so hard for so many years that I set myself up to a place where it's like, well, I'm going to, I'll be, I'll be okay. Like, you know, if this lasts for months or even a year, I'm not going to like it, but it's what, uh, it's what we have to deal with at this point. Um, so it's just a matter of really just kind of taking it in and, you know, try really try to help helping others yeah. as much as I can. And that's one thing that I will say is like, when I started like going to all these protests all the time and really like feeling the energy of this revolution and this change that's happening is I, for the first time in 10 years, I stopped thinking about myself so much. And I stopped thinking about how I can advance my career and what emails I need to send today. And God, and how, how can I get on this show or in that club? That's all I used to think about. And now because of all of this i've had time to go well no well what do other people need from me how can i be more of service to them than i am of myself mm. if i can't get on stage and make people laugh and give people a release then how else can i do it and really just like through like protesting and fundraising i'm doing a weekly instagram live every monday with my friend temasol and we do a different do different charity every time that people can live donate so like just doing like things like that has been a real benefactor for me of just being really beneficial just to really show more positive light going on um when everything around kind of seems dark and i just kind of changed my methodology of like how can i give something back to people if i can't do it directly through laughter and that that i think has been really good for me absolutely and i i am curious what you think about you know once again, whatever our new life looks like, hopefully it'll be, I mean, I'm prepared to live like this at least through the end of 2020. Hopefully 2021 will see some sense of normalcy, but I'm wondering, you know, this is a time in history where it's very dark. We're all going through it together. And we've had, you know, we've had wars, we had 9-11, we're having the pandemic, we're having all of these things. And I'm wondering, do you think that comedy is going to help us like continue to get through and then once we're out of this and we can go to clubs again and we can start living life like we did before do you think that people are going to be craving that laughter and that that sense of wow we're going to celebrate with laughter i hope so um i think i comedy will always be there no matter what comedy is important and people definitely need it um whether some people will acknowledge that they need it and other people don't but like if you're if you're not moving your way through life laughing like something is going on there but the scary part of it is a comedy club is essentially the most dangerous place you could be right now right. like a small enclosed dark room where everyone is going ha, 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 and you know all of your droplets are <laughs> shooting all over the room you put 200 people in the same closed tiny slow ceiling tiny space it is a hotbed of fucking deathly viruses right. in there and unless we have a vaccine or something like that like that part of things is not really going to come back for a while but it's going to allow people to open themselves up to what kind of comedy shows we can run like i've already seen people doing things in parks and like the zoom shows and trying to figure out ways to have the experience but still be socially distanced enough where everyone feels safe um parking lot shows are happening a lot uh in new york there's a big one happening in long island city that uh, michael che has been running and literally they are standing in the back of a pickup truck but there's 300 people sitting on the ground and they drew lines so everybody has their area they're all six feet apart and we're going to start seeing a lot more things like that people are going to have to innovate people are going to have to get really creative in the way that we can perform and do shows safely because that's the only thing that matters right now anytime people have asked me to do shows, to do a few shows recently. And I said, well, what are you doing to ensure safety? They're like, oh, we're just kind of telling people to wear a mask and, oh. the best. and, I'm, and I'm like, I'm like, uh -uh. I can't. I, I can't, I can't be the comedian that goes on stage and then happens to be where an infection breaks out of some kind. And then I have to be the one to be like, I'm so sorry. Cause I've already watched comedians have to do that. And 
it just seems selfish, right? It just seems like you're not serv- you're not thinking about them. You're servicing your own needs. And right now, that's the worst thing you could be doing is we need, we really need to join forces and unite and figure out how we can all play safely. You know, if we yeah. can't, if no one, if we can't play safely, if all of us can't do it, then none of us are going to be able to do it. And that's really unfortunate because morons are going out there and ruining this for other people who are trying to be respectful to a global pandemic and realize that we're not above it. Like some people just seem, it's, it, they seem to think like, well, it's not going to happen to me. And that's the worst attitude. And then it happens right to now. them. And then they affect their family. They affect people that didn't even know they affected. It's, isn't it crazy that we're sitting here talking, we're in t- completely different places. And yet we're all dealing with this same, like, it's not even national, it's global. It's, ev- it's just like, it's still, I don't know how many months it's been that it's still just like, you wonder when you're going to wake up from the stream. Well, yeah. talk about where people can find you because there are still ways to laugh during this time. And, you know, whenever we can, people can see you in person a year, multiple years from now, who knows, but where can people find you online? Yeah. Um, my website's hoopercomedy.com. Uh, my, all my social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, if you're a grandmother, uh, is just at Hooper Hair Puff. Uh, I'm sure we'll put that in some sort of link. Yes. Uh, I know it's on Show there, notes, yeah. Hooper Hair Puff. Um, and that's the easiest way to find me. My YouTube channel is just Alex Hooper Comedy. Um, you can watch a bunch of clips on there. Um, I have meditation videos that are pretty funny. Um, you know, but my website, if you go to my website, hoopercomedy.com, you will find everything else from there. And that's the easiest place to go. Awesome. Well, this has been so great, Alex. Thank you so much for being on Changers and Creators.